Um, so thank you to both the folklore and Jewish studies programs, and in particular Char Charles Briggs and Benjamin Brenner and, and um, Edda and, and Kimmy and all those who helped arrange the logistics of, of bringing me here. Uh, the talk today, Remembering the Ephemeral, the Ritual Architecture of Sukkot in Contemporary Life, is indeed um, drawn from the book that, that Charles has mentioned. And I will be giving some, some vignettes from it, bits and pieces, because it can't be too long of a talk. But, but anything that is evoked, I'm always happy to continue on later in conversation. In his classic work, The Shape of Time, art, art historian George Kubler expounds upon the unending human endeavor of trying to fully experience any event. He writes, quote, the galaxy whose light I see now may have ceased to exist millennia ago. And by the same token, men cannot fully sense any event until after it has happened. Until it is history, until it is the dust and ash of that cosmic storm which we call the present and which perpetually rages throughout creation." End quote. In the wake of an occurrence, our consciousness of its meaning occurs. In other words, people can only fully sense or only fully understand an event when remembering its ephemeral existence. This talk underscores Kubler's words by examining a ritual practice that holds both ephemerality and remembrance at its core. Described through fieldwork vignettes are individuals who observe an ancient ritual, an ancient Jewish holiday called Sukkot, a biblical festival that commemorates the Israelites' journey through the Sinai Desert to the Promised Land after the exodus from Egypt. For thousands of years, practicing Jews around the world have reinterpreted this historic event through an annual autumn ritual that celebrates survival and questions permanence, that envisions both physical and metaphoric protection and defines home. Performing this ritual, people create works of art, temporary architectures called Sukkot, that evoke the Israelites' nomadic shelters on their journey. Shelters that become species of intensified personal meaning for the single holiday week that they stand. From 2007 through 2015, I documented Sukkot observance and conducted ethnographic research within, with a multicultural range of builders and users of Sukkot. I began my research in Bloomington, Indiana in 2007 and 8, then traveled to Jerusalem, Israel, to document the practice in 2009, continued in Tel Aviv in 2010 and 2011, and finally observed the holiday in Orthodox Jewish parts of Brooklyn, New York in 2014 and 15. This particular sukkah is, um, is from some of my research in 2009 in Israel. The cases shared here sketch the arc of framing Sukkot, the <coughs> book that resulted from this study. The selected images illustrate the remarkable diversity of sukkah construction, decoration, and use across the years and sites of my research, and importantly, highlight the ways in which individual interpretations of this ancient ephemeral architectural tradition resonate with new relevance each year. Each family featured in my research imparted a message through the distinctive creation and use of their ritual structure that reached beyond the boundaries of the holiday week a message about social values, community cohesion, or hope, one that anchored them in the past and projected them into the future. These individuals build and use their Sukkot each year to locate their place on a journey toward a home that is no longer a physical destination, but a metaphor and an ideal. So before explaining any more about the research, let me just say a few words about the holiday for those who aren't familiar. The annual holiday of Sukkot commemorates the divine protection that the Israelites received during their 40-year journey to, through the, to the Promised Land. Because of its seasonal timing, which is, alternates between late September and early October, the holiday has traditionally been celebrated as a harvest festival, and together with Passover and Shavuot is one of the three historic pilgrimage holidays to the Temple in Jerusalem, the ritual center of ancient Israel. The book of Leviticus states the original commandment of Sukkot observance and its significance in verse 2343. Quote, you shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Throughout history, religious, academic, and legal authorities have produced lengthy interpretations of this very brief commandment that prescribes the observance of Sukkot. The essential requirements of sukkah construction, however, and sukkah is the singular of Sukkot, 
which uh, means booth or tabernacle and is the name of these structures. The essential requirements of the construction are few. According to Jewish religious law, first, the sukkah must have at least two full walls that are, that are connected to each other, and a third that is at least one tefach or handbreadth wide. And second, the skach or the roof covering must be made of organic matter gathered from the earth. Interpretations and elaborations of these two brief laws of construction fill the Sukkot tractates in the Talmud, the central Jewish texts containing the oral law, and in later rabbinic writings. Examples of these rabbinic interpretations declare that the roof covering must provide more shade than sun inside the sukkah on a bright day, that nothing such as a tree may cover the sukkah and act as a second roof, and that one must be able to see the stars in the sky through the weaving of the roof. Innumerable, innumerable debates about the requirements over the years are due to interpreters' differing social and spiritual goals for the experience of dwelling in the sukkah. The biblical text, the material creation, and the interpretive discourse are thus linked in interdependent relation. Here we have a little collage of some of the images from <coughs> Bloomington, Indiana. Um, I visited 18 families. Those were, uh, that was the amount that was uh, practicing, the number that pra was practicing in 2007 and 8. And you can see already most of these were located in backyards or on back porches, uh, made out of anything from prefabricated kits uh, and PVC piping to wood trellis and tarps. So looking, of course, at the construction and the placement of the actual the structure and then the decoration as well. With few legal requirements and myriad symbolic meanings, the ritual of Sukkot enables individuals to connect with a common Jewish historical consciousness through the structure's physical and conceptual construction. Historically, the sukkah evokes a period of displacement in Jewish life and the search for home and homeland. Religiously, it symbolizes the clouds of glory with which God surrounded the Israelites to protect them in the wilderness. Ecologically, it acknowledges the relationship between the Jewish people and the natural world and embodies an idealization of a simpler existence. Culturally, it challenges the value and permanence of the material surroundings that human beings increasingly acquire and upon which they increasingly rely. And individually, each sukkah acknowledges a Jewish tradition and defines the builder's self through personal creative expression. As a defining feature of the sukkah, the skach is the only material that determines whether the structure is pure. The requirements of the walls pertain to their number and size, not material, and therefore the materials used to construct the frame and walls have varied over time without compromising the structure's religious legality. For example, today's increasingly popular prefabricated sukkah kit, like the bottom left corner here, which provides a reusable metal frame and nylon fabric walls, replaces formerly widespread handmade constructions of wood and brush. Alternatively, in many countries, including Yemen and Israel, a room of one's permanent home may be transformed into a sukkah once a year by removing pieces of the roofing for the holiday week. So here, um, and the top right image, this is at the home of um, a family that emigrated from Yemen in 92 to Israel. And they remove that portion of the roof covering. And um, although people sit all on the porch, really it's legally under that portion of the skach that the sukkah is legal. And then um, right here is another example of that. You can see the brush on the lower portion of the house, that roof. They've removed the roofing there and covered it with brush during the holiday week. And that is on a religious moshav in southern Israel, um, Maswot Yitzchak. So I, I uh, yeah. <laughs> Although decoration of the sukkah is not prescribed in biblical verse, oh, excuse me. During the time, this, the week of the holiday, the roof is replaced, as you can see, legitimizing the observance within. Such diversity in the sukkah's form demonstrates the creative incorporation of local resources and emerging practices in the construction of ritual space, while maintaining allegiance to the religious requirement of the skach to ensure its sanctity. Although decoration of the sukkah is not prescribed in the biblical verse, for many, it has become as meaningful a part of the material ritual as the construction of the frame. The sukkah's decoration, like the structure's construction, communicates elements of the local environment. 
In the personalized decoration of the sukkah, people transform the ritual structure into a place of individual expression and social belonging. And now, before I continue reading, I'll just share some photos from my research in Israel uh, to give you a sense of the diversity. So this is, this is all in South Tel Aviv, unless I say otherwise. And uh, this particular one is the family, a Bukharan family that emigrated from Uzbekistan. Um, they built this right in what was a, the parking spot for their truck that's now on the road. So part of my interest was seeing how this dense neighborhood in South Tel Aviv transformed during the week, how this urban space became ritual space and where people did that. So you might drive by and not necessarily see it even, although this is a, a fairly obvious structure. Um, this is the inside. They decorate with tapestries that they brought from Uzbekistan. Uh, Dina right here has demonstrated, she brought out all their ceremonial clothes. They did a little fashion show for me. Um, these are outfits they wear every evening um, during the holiday. They were standing with some of their children there, David and Zina. And among the questions I was interested in asking them when I would talk to them about the space were the pictures that they hang on the walls. Um, for example, the blue poster on the far right that you can't really see is, is a picture of kind of the political organization from Uzbekistan. They were still following and involved in politics in the homeland, so trying to understand where they place themselves, uh, where their homes ground them um, in Israel and formerly. This is Yoram. He, his family is from Yemen originally. Uh, he and his father lived across the street. His father built their house. And then this is kind of a dirt parking lot that they build their sukkah in each year. So this, again, was an example. Um, every other day of the year, it's kind of ordinary, rather dirty space, actually. And then for the one week of the holiday, this ordinary space, space becomes extraordinary. And he, among others, told me that this sukkah, actually, the space within the sukkah, is even more religious, even more holy than the synagogue during the week of, the, of Sukkot because it was prescribed by God directly. It wasn't mediated by people. So something that could have been filled with kind of trash, this site that is normally a little bit un, unkept, um, becomes one of the holiest for them. This is another family from Uzbekistan. Um, they hang fruit from the roof. They said they did that in Uzbekistan as well. And the matriarch, the second from the right, she has 11 children, and she waited to emigrate until all of them were able. And they now all live in the neighborhood, very closely knit community of Bukharan Jews. And uh, they gather for dinner every night in their courtyard where this is built. And the immediate family is over 100 people each Shabbat. This is uh, another family that builds on their kind of long side porch, originally from Afghanistan, their children um, the adult children don't live in the neighborhood anymore, but they come back to their parents each year to celebrate. This is another Bukharan family. Again, this bottom image is kind of the shared, unused courtyard space um, between a few buildings that just kind of collects unneeded items. And they build their sukkah there out of prefabricated materials mostly. Um, always the door is open, welcoming people in from the neighborhood. The neighborhood is lower income, largely, and, and you see a lot of structures that are use recycled materials that they collect all over the, all over the area. So doors and, and pieces of wood, like this. This is a man uh, who came alone from Afghanistan when he was 14 and preserves all these tapestries very um, fastidiously, museum quality, acid-free paper in boxes all year until Sukkot. And he will walk you through the story of his immigration, talking about each of these tapestries. This is an image of three men in the neighborhood who, um, they, they're all divorced men, and they kind of became friends after all becoming divorced. And they decided to, to share this ritual together. They basically build this sukkah together each year. And it's a very social, happy space. They welcome people in, and for that moment, really try and create more of a community. This is the sukkah um, built by a man from Syria originally, Eliyahu. And it's the only sukkah on the block. And everybody comes. Uh, his wife, every night, here he is inside. His wife, every night, grills outside. She prepares food for everyone. Uh, he told me about how this block of neighbors is actually not, 
they don't all get along. Um, he complains about people playing their music too loudly, and he doesn't, he doesn't feel great about everyone. However, during the holiday week, everyone comes, everybody eats, he won't turn anyone away. So I'll talk a little bit more about it, but the hospitality that's built into the custom really allows there for, be a, for there to be a liminal space and time, a liminal moment where social relations are strengthened um, outside of what they normally are. Another Bukharan family uh, that gathers with their, for lunch with a very elaborate multi-course meal that is a whole talk of its own. This is a prefabricated sukkah built by a man from, um, of Yemenite origin and very richly decorated, although the images aren't great because it was evening. But uh, he talked through his travels for work when he described all these commercial, manufactured, kind of glittery, tinselly items that are hanging. He gathered them. He travels to Asia quite a bit for work. And as I learned his life history and his family history, uh, very important for him to communicate how he's moved out of the neighborhood. Um, having lived, grown up there and lived there in a, in a less um, socioeconomic, socioeconomically elevated place than he would like, these trips allow for him to really find another side of himself and another vision for what is possible. So those stories came out through the decoration. This is the family of um, Iranian descent, and the lace walls are a tradition that go back there, one, one tradition for Sukkot. Um, you can also see that it's in the courtyard, and multiple items that were just kind of discarded have been used to build the walls for legal reasons to make them sturdy enough um, temporary but still standing. And here we have a family, actually a gathering of neighbors. Uh, this is not in that same neighborhood. It's in Rehovot. I went to another neighboring little town, city, um, outside of Tel Aviv. And this is a complex and a neighborhood home to Ethiopian Jews, largely. Uh, this man, Baruch Rada, I met him on the street and we started talking and he was really wonderful. And, and uh, you know, the, the, you can't quite tell, but it was a prefa prefabricated structure, empty inside, no decoration, fairly worn out. And so I walked up, it's standing in front of a concrete complex, and started talking to him about Sukkot and my research, and asked him when he arrived, and he said the early 80s. And uh, I asked him if he built Sukkot in Ethiopia, and he said, of course, for gener you know, as long as you can remember. And he started describing how he builds them. And on the left, he's demonstrating that they were woven with um, tree branches completely out of brush. So entirely green structure. I thought it sounded very beautiful and natural and uh, kind of captured the wilderness experience. So I said, oh, why don't you do that here? Because there are palm trees everywhere. And he just looked at me as though I was crazy. And he said, why would I do that? I'm in a modern state. And I, you know. It, it was a moment early in the field work where I was trying to figure out how people make meaning out of the material. And he really brought me back to understanding the space that's created by the, the walls of the sukkah, not just the material. So there's no decoration. But every night, all the neighbors rotate responsibilities, um, bringing, bringing different foods down. They're different cooks each evening. They bring their own roasted coffee and beer and music. And they gather there. And this woman, Leah, on the left, talked to me about how here um, in this also lower income neighborhood, all these friends, these neighbors, everyone's working long hours, manual labor. Um, all the women are cleaning either homes or schools. And there's just no time to socialize. And in Ethiopia, the village set up the physical layout as well as the more agricultural lifestyle allowed for women to gather, allowed for families to gather and to be together. And now in this high-rise complex and with the, the labor that they currently have, it's, um, that is diminished. So Sukkot is one of the few times they really recreate this space. And it was a really warm evening, really wonderful evening. This is uh, a man from Kurdish descent in Jerusalem who talked about the tapestries. These are memorial cloths that he borrows, four from the synagogue his father prayed in Kurdish synagogue and four from the synagogue that his mother prayed in, another Kurdish synagogue across the street that represented their two different villages. And uh, he said, what more does a man need to say about his identity than where his parents are from? So he borrows these as a way to bring back uh, his family. And here we have a family, the sukkah's on this rounded porch, uh, Dina and Yitzchak. He sleeps in it on the mattress on the right. 
and uh, she's of Yemenite descent, and he's of Syrian descent, and they, uh, they just talked about welcoming in strangers. For them, hospitality was at the core, and she has a, a tradition of gathering pomegranates each day from Sukkot, um, the Sukkot that she visits of her friends, and bringing one back and hanging them in tinfoil in the sukkah on the wall. You can see on the left, maybe, some of the tinfoil balls. At the end of the holiday, she juices all those pomegranates together and distributes that juice from the seven pomegranates to women in the neighborhood having trouble with um, fertility issues that year, which is, you know, tells you a lot about the kind of tightness of the neighborhood, that people know this, and then how these social networks are created and supported through rituals such as this. And then here is a compilation of small images from, it, from New York. Uh, so mostly Williamsburg and Crown Heights. Actually, this bottom one is Jerusalem. Uh, but these are of Ashkenazi Orthodox compared to the Mizrahi images before. These are Ashkenazi builders and mostly all wooden, built on porches, porches staggered in some cases. Um, buildings are built with staggered porches to allow for Sukkot practice. And uh, many richly decorated with kind of manufactured commercial items to give you a sense of the diversity. So grounded in the sukkah's materiality, the most widely embraced interpretation of the ritual structure regards it as a symbol of the domestic space, a physical manifestation of and meditation on the Israelites' nomadic existence in the desert. Observers thus pray, eat, socialize, and even sleep inside these structures for the week of the holiday. The notion of belonging, one of the holiday's central concepts, resonates with particular significance as domestic hospitality lies at the heart of Sukkot observance and is realized through the custom of welcoming outsiders into one sukkah for food, drink, and rest. Sukkot observers frequent, frequently recall as the model for their hospitality the biblical story of Abraham, welcoming three strangers into his tent. And in return for the kind gesture, Abraham's unexpected guests reveal to him that he and his wife will soon expect a child. As one sukkah builder explained to me, God and he, God loves hospitality. Abraham, our father, searched for guests to host, and God said, first you will respect hospitality, and then you will respect me. Hospitality grounds social behavior for the week of Sukkot, both affirming and challenging presumed positions of insider and outsider. The sukkah guards a space of inclusivity as a temporary ritual structure that is defined by its both moment in and out of time, a liminality that suspends ordinary boundaries around and beliefs about belonging until the holiday ends. A second sukkah builder explained the significance of the temporary outdoor placement of the sukkah in, in relation to the notion of belonging. He said, the sukkah is a space of meeting. It's supposed to be a way to be together in solidarity and partnership before the arrival. And this he said referring to the journey to the promised land in the biblical narrative. The ritual of hosting and being hosted in the sukkah prompts this man to reconsider each year how to open his home and heart to unfamiliarity and difference. Here, the significance of the sukkah space comes not only from its materiality, but from its temporality as well, from the moment of potential that it re represents annually and annually creates anew. As a place of meeting before arrival, the temporary sukkah has the power to bridge difference by allowing for conscious reflection about how to live together peacefully with others. What does it mean to belong to a society? And how are social boundaries created and crossed? Sukkot, a holiday that recalls the shelter provided in the desert during a people's search for home, holds the quest to belong and to accept at its core. To convey what I'm describing more visually, I want to share with you the experience of one family, featured in my research but not yet in the pictures, whose ritual observance exemplifies the power of this ephemeral tradition. Then I will briefly comment on the two political events that coincided with my fieldwork in Israel from 2010 to 2011 both of which urgently related Sukkot observance to contemporary social issues. When I traveled to Israel in 2010, I had chosen to base the majority of my ethnographic research in the working class neighborhood of Shkonat Hatikva, which means neighborhood of hope in South Tel Aviv, because of its diversity of Jewish residents uh, and cultural expression. It's home largely to Jews who emigrated from Yemen, Iran, Iraq, Morocco, Syria, Egypt, Afghanistan, and Uzbekistan from 1930 to 1990. Over the course of my 16 months there, however, I also visited several other neighborhoods with similar demographics for comparative data. One such site was in Yafo, the ancient port city to the south of Tel Aviv, 
where the Moyal family of Moroccan and Syrian descent lives. I was astounded when I saw Shaul Moyal's sukkah for the first time from the car window as I approached his apartment building. It stu stood below the concrete overhang of a cream-colored complex in front of a parking lot, surrounded by concrete pillars and a metal fence that enclosed the residential lot. The sukkah's frame was made of wooden panels and illuminated by hundreds of primary colored lights and hanging decorations. Up close, the decorative detail appeared even more extravagant. The sukkah's four walls had images of palm trees, stars, moons, and suns that Shaul had carved into the wood, as well as the words Sukkot Shalom, or Sukkah of Peace, cut into multiple panels. In front of the sukkah, a large plaque hung above the entrance that also read Sukkah of Peace, engraved in large letters. Into all the cutout words and images, Shaul had inserted multicolored plexiglass to create the effect of stained glass and had placed a clock in the center of a circle cut out sun. The floor was covered with a black and white checkered linoleum uh, cover on top of which stood a long oblong table that he had built and decorated with colorful jeweled patterns. Chandeliers that Shaul had covered in sparkling plastic jewels, miniature disco balls, and strands of multicolored lights and crystals dangled from inside the sukkah's roof so densely that it was nearly impossible to see the actual bamboo roofing. And pink, blue, and silver streaked plastic garlands were woven into the trellised interior. Several outdoor sconces were affixed to the top interior of the walls, and Shoal had installed, you'll see behind, to the left back of his head, installed both a landline phone and an intercom by the sukkah's entrance, which he had wired to an exterior telephone pole. Uh, to avoid repeatedly ascending and descending the four flights of stairs to his upstairs apartment to communicate with family and friends up there. When he showed me the electrical panel at the back of the sukkah, it had 10 light switches, which he proudly flipped up and down to illuminate the multi-glowing um, multi effect, flashing strings, colored bulbs, and glowing sconces. I'm sorry, I don't have a video of it for you. Outside the sukkah to the right of the entrance, he had also built a covered platform, red cloth, which, uh, upon which he would display a large range of homemade Moroccan sweets, delights on the first most elaborate feast night of Sukkot. Shaul has been using the same structure for over 30 years. Although he reuses it each year, he has worked to improve its design since its creation. Early on, he found it was too windy inside, so he replaced the cloth walls with wood. One year, when, he, when it rained the entire holiday week and flooded the sukkah's interior, he was inspired to build a wooden foundation, upon which now the table chairs and guests sit. Most recently, in 2009, when trays of sweets and decorative objects were stolen from inside his sukkah, he built doors that bolt shut and installed a camera on the wall of the apartment building to guard the ritual structure. The sukkah's interior is also under constant reevaluation as he redesigns the decor to express his latest aesthetic ideas. He's an artist not in his profession, but in his life, said his daughter as the tour ended. We sat down in the sukkah for Moroccan mint tea. Shaul said that he began building the sukkah when his first daughter was born. However, he continued, quote, I had the dream to make this sukkah from the age of 10. We used to make a sukkah in Morocco out of reeds and sticks. Once we would finish building it and sit down to eat, the wind would blow it over and knock it down. It was then that I said, that's not good enough. It should be strong. I would walk around and visit the Sukkot of other people, rich people who had nice, strong Sukkot. And I said to myself, we're not rich, but when I'm older, I'm going to make a Sukkah that's even more beautiful. Shaul was born in Marrakesh, Morocco in 1938, and he immigrated to Israel with his mother and brother in 1956. He grew up in a part of Marrakesh that he describes as a fortress or a camp surrounded by a wall that enclosed Jewish shops and homes with an entrance gate that was guarded by a Muslim Moroccan official. Quote, only Jews lived inside there, he said. The Arabs were outside. Arabs could only enter if they had business to conduct inside, and they couldn't enter at all on Shabbat. This was the Mela, or the Jewish quarter that separated Marrakesh's Jews from Muslims. Shoal lived in the Mela until he was, until he was 16 years old, following strong social and religious routines that prescribed his early life there. Both as a boy in Morocco and as a young man in Israel, Shaul was shaped by inspiration and hard work. When I asked about the elaborate adornment inside his sukkah, he recounted the moment in Marrakesh that opened his eyes to the worlds of color and design. My mother's sister had her own private house, and my sister got married at her home when I was a child. 
When I went to my aunt's house on the, on the wedding day, someone took me away and put me in another house. They didn't know who I was. In that house, there was a mosaic, one meter 20 long, and stunning paintings all over the house. I saw them in every room, on every wall. I wondered about these stones, the mosaics. How did they paste them? They were beautiful and smooth. How did they do it? From then on, I began to look at the places where the Arabs were praying, and I became concerned with all things that were beautiful. This moment was the beginning of Shaul's cultivation of an aesthetic sensibility. Thereafter, he said he developed an eye for color and design and all the tiling and construction work he did to help support his family throughout his young adulthood. When I asked again about the sukkah of his youth, he recalled its stark construction compared to these sites of mosaic beauty. He said it was just a sheet, a few planks of wood and sticks that were tied together with string. But across the space on the opposite wall from where you entered, my mother hung the most beautiful tapestry. For the entire year, you were not allowed to take it out of the house, but on Sukkot, she would take it out and hang it in the sukkah. It was the most beautiful carpet. The vivid picture in his mind of this tapestry affirmed his association of the sukkah space with rare value and beauty. His reverence for the sanctity of the space is deeply rooted in and contrasted with his impoverished and precious home and precarious home environment in Morocco and after immigration in the low-income neighborhood of Yafo Dalit. His early life experiences in Morocco inspired his vision of the beauty that he would later create in his personal and professional life. In addition to the wall hanging, one other feature of the ritual space of Shaul's youth mattered deeply to him, the lighting. In Morocco, we had only one light, which we rented from the Arabs, he said. They rented us the house, and they rented us one light, no more. Any more was prohibited. They had electricity in their houses, and we had only candles and lanterns. So the, lantern, the landlord rented us the light every day, but if you didn't turn it off by 10 p.m., he would turn it off from his home. That was it. Today, Shaul's sukkah is filled with lights, multicolored, large, small, flashing, fixed, draped from strings, hanging on the octopus arms of chandeliers, and glittering in sconces. Shaul controls them with the panel of switches, and their illumination during the tour was a cause of great joy. When he recounted the story of the single light in the home of his youth, Shaul's daughter, Sivan, who is there listening, chuckled and said, oh, so you've compensated here for what happened in Morocco. Shaul didn't hear her, but continued to admire the sea of shining lights in the sukkah behind us. For Shaul, his sukkah is a place of dreams, a place where he can create all that he was denied. When I asked what he thinks about when he sits inside his sukkah, Shaul responded, I try to think of the best idea yet, how I can make it better next year. I hope that I will get a better idea than this one, for there's no end to beauty. His sukkah is a place of creativity, a place to dream of the future in spite of, in spite of and because of the past, and a place of hope. 38-year-old year Sivan, 38 year old Sivan, the youngest of Shaul's four daughters, helps her father each year from the first day of sukkah construction, which he begins at least five weeks before the holiday begins, until the last day of its deconstruction. When I asked her what the ritual of sukkah construction meant to her, she replied that people build their homes exactly as they build their lives. And what is it to build your life? It's building relationships with people, developing emotions. I commented that in modern urban societies where space and time is limited, the sukkah provides a rare opportunity for individuals to pause and translate their experiences into ideals and through the design and construction of a personal space. Sivan nodded and smiled and pulled out a paper napkin from under her coffee cup. She began to sketch narrating the strokes of her pen. The table and everyone around the table, that's your life. She was sketching a sukkah. Who sits around the table? In Jewish tradition, strangers sit around the table, but that's as in life, for there are strangers in life. But who's sitting close to you? Those are the people closest to you, your family. What is the skach lying over your head? This, is, this protects you. What are the decorations in your sukkah? They are the ornaments that decorate your life, the things that make you complete. When Moroccans put beautiful tapestries on the wall, she said, they add cultural content to their lives. It's like the carpet on the wall of our sukkah and the ornaments which come later. They are the symbol of culture. But the basic structure, the wood, the natural materials, those are the connections. Those are the corner poles and the beams on the roof that are connected with ropes. Those are exactly the ties you have with people in your life. On the napkin Sivan sketched, that Sivan had sketched, the square frame of a sukkah with brush lying on top and a lamp hanging down over the table in the sukkah center. As she spoke, she drew arrows pointing to all the parts of the sukkah and labeling them. Near the top left pole, she had written ksharim, or ties. 
Near the lamp, she had jotted ruchanit, or spirituality. And next to the table, a sideways word read mishpachtit, or familiarity or intimacy, an adjective from the root word for family. Along the left side of the sukkah, she had written ani and abba, or me and father. Sivan's simple sketch was deeply meaningful. In the construction of her family's sukkah, she saw the framework of a social and cultural life, and for her personally, the bond between herself and her father. Sivan then spoke about the temporary nature of this ritual form express, expressed in its simultaneous instability and promise of return. The annual recurrence of the sukkah teaches hope and perseverance, she said, acknowledging how the sukkah evokes for her the struggles of her parents' immigration experiences. As a child, her mother was smuggled from Syria to Israel through underground networks of Jewish immigrants. Once there, she, like Sivan's father, lived in refugee camps for several years before establishing a new life for herself by cleaning others' homes. My parents had no basis for a productive and healthy future, said Sivan. Their absor absorption in Israel was without value. They had reached a wasteland. In the hard life my father lived, she says, the portability of the sukkah meant do not despair, do not lose hope. As my father says, it was destroyed, build it again. The resonance of the sukkah's characteristics with the experiences of Sivan's parents is striking, but she admits the absence of this connection in her own life. When I asked if she would build a sukkah of her own one day, she said, my father, he's my twin, my soulmate. He's my life, and if I ever make a sukkah, it will only be for my father, to activate the memory and express my love through this gesture as a tribute. I would not do it for tradition and not for faith. And this just brings us back to the point that it's all about connections, it's all about people, it's all about love. If I do it, it's just for that, she said. Contrasting intentions motivate Shaul and Sivan in their common Sukkot observance, but they share a commitment to reconciling their personal and social needs with the conditions of their existence through tangible creative expression. The Moyal family, like others I met throughout my research, affirm the power of this temporary yet recurring ritual in the formation of self and community. So now moving from the familial to the societal, I'll share a few words about the backdrops to my research. Two compelling sociopolitical situations that developed during my fieldwork, the period of my fieldwork in Israel, framed this research in unexpectedly significant ways. The first concerned the ongoing migration of as African asylum seekers into Israel across the southern border, a circumstance that had a serious effect on Shkunat HaTikva, the neighborhood um, in which I had based my ethnographic research. And as a side note, of course, there's a deeper history of contestation in this neighborhood um, as occupied physical space. But the, this project here and this talk today picks up where, where the Mizrahi population there have already established themselves. And the project is oriented towards them as a marginalized population within an unequal multicultural Israel. So this paper, this talk, kind of reflects the ethnography of the present that is this um, project. As I mentioned, Shkunat HaTikva is home to Jewish populations of Middle Eastern, North African, and Central Asian origin, whose beliefs and practices are rooted in their common religious heritage, in the Arab nations from which they emigrated, and in contemporary Israeli society. Since the 90s, HaTikva has increasingly become home to non-Jewish foreign migrants. And beginning in 2005, an influx of Eritrean and Sudanese asylum seekers fleeing hardship and violence in their home countries sought refuge in Israel and were placed in low-income neighborhoods across the country, such as several neighborhoods in South Tel Aviv. By 2013, the number of Eritrean and Sudanese asylum seekers living within Israel's borders had exceeded 60,000. These new populations occupy a liminal space in Israeli society. They're allowed to enter the country in search of sanctuary and to forge a better life, and they nonetheless have unrecognized status, are denied work permits, and subsist on insufficient government aid. The public outcry by the Jewish community of Shkunat HaTikva regarding the waves of incoming asylum seekers resulted from the growing danger that they perceived to the safety, stability, and identity of their neighborhood. As reports of increased crime in the area circulated um, and concerns for its Jewish identity grew, the community blamed the Israeli government for placing thousands of desperate individuals in the nation's poorest areas. For them, absorbing large numbers of non-Jews with different social, cultural, religious, and linguistic traditions in their neighborhood was undermining its Jewish character and way of life. This reaction revealed not only how veteran Jewish residents viewed the newcomers, but how they viewed themselves as being discriminated against by more privileged Israelis and by the government. 
all of which contributed to the sense of self and other that characterizes their religious, social, and cultural beliefs and practices. And here are images both from the asylum seekers themselves in central Tel Aviv, and then particularly in the, in the shuk, in the market, in Shkonat Hatikva, many, <coughs> many protests throughout 2010. Although I conducted my research interviews with a focus on Sukkot ritual belief and practice, with the ever-present concern about foreign immigration, conversations inevitably expanded to include a range of broader concerns and histories. I wasn't alone in recognizing the similarity and resonance between the plight of the asylum seekers and the narrative of Sukkot. When veteran residents explained their interpretation of the Israelites' journey through the desert, several of them connected the story of Sukkot to contemporary migration of the Eritrean and Sudanese asylum seekers who were also crossing Egypt into the land of Israel in search of safety, opportunity, and home. These residents noted the parallel with empathy for the homeless foreigners, but also with concern, conscious of the tension between the ritual obligation to welcome the stranger into one's sukkah and home and the fear of doing so. Two contrasting yet comparable journeys toward home now coexisted in a single place, evoking complex questions about social belonging of a Jewish population historically treated as other in Israel, ritually reliving the dislocation of the ancient Israelites, and of a non-Jewish population currently displaced from their homelands, also seeking refuge and being treated as other in Israel. Demonstrations against the government's policies by both the Jewish residents of South Tel Aviv and by the asylum seekers themselves occurred regularly throughout 2010. As the next celebration of Sukkot approached in 2011, a second unexpected sociopolitical event burst out. This event unfolded, causing the public to re-envision Sukkot in a dramatic new way. Unprecedented civil demonstrations against social and economic inequality in Israel first in July 2011, coinciding with the worldwide national and international demonstrations known as the Occupy Movement. From midsummer through the fall of 2011, in Hatikva's public park in South Tel Aviv, the neighborhood's homeless and lowest income residents built and inhabited a tent encampment to protest rising costs of living and to demand public housing reform in Israel. As Sukkot approached that October, participants in the Israeli protests seamlessly incorporated the messages of the protest movement into the material and spiritual practice of Sukkot, building temporary ritual shelters right next to their temporary encampments. By joining the call for housing and home with the holiday's narrative, they layered on a striking new interpretation to the ancient narrative of the holiday. This is a picture of the community, one of the community, really the main community sukkah that was built in the public park, um, surrounded by tents. There were other individual Sukkot, but this was the primary one. By using Sukkot in the protest camp to highlight housing issues in Israeli society, <coughs> protesters reversed a fundamental notion for which Sukkot is known. The ephemeral Sukkah, which positively affirms human equality, was reconceived as a negative sign of material disadvantage. Holding both these concepts simultaneously, the Sukkah now embodied a new tension, the ritual celebration of being sheltered and the actual experience of lacking home. By participating in protest demonstrations, asserting the need for how housing and longing for home, residents of South Tel Aviv actively engaged in the politics of space and belonging, foundational concepts in the observance of Sukkot. The global protests against economic inequality dramatized bibli the biblical narrative that had produced a ritual of reflection on materiality and home for thousands of years. By reimagining the Sukkot narrative in this contemporary context, they continued the journey of survival and reflection that Sukkot commemorates. The Sukkah's symbolic potential is endless, but its material form is fleeting. The experience of building and inhabiting the Sukkah endures while the physical structure itself appears and disappears, paradoxically ensuring a lasting architectural expression. While the study of ephemerality does not capture what is retained over time, as does the typical folkloristic study of tradition, it deepens our awareness of the passing of time through its impermanence. Folklorist Kay Turner writes that, quote, ephemerality humanizes time by referring us to the exigencies of our mortality. In the ritual of sukkah construction and use, the performance of self and awareness of the present are heightened as notions of the eternal and of life and death invest the evanescent experience with meaning. The individuals in this exhibit who reflected upon the temporary nature of the sukkot ritual 
were acutely aware of what is lasting in life. Material ephemerality made them consider spiritual permanence, the awareness of each concept illuminating the other. In Shkunat Hatikva, 74-year-old David Zada, who emigrated from Persia and lived a life of displacement and economic struggle, recognized the permanent spiritual shelter that his impermanent ritual dwelling offered. For material things are mutable, but the sukkah is ever recurring, temporally and metaphorically. The sukkah is similar to the house, he said, but the house is temporary. It comes and goes. The sukkah is forever. In the Talmud, it is written that the sukkah is a metaphor for what is eternal, he said. In the deepest sense, the sukkah humanizes time by awakening us not to the, only to the exigencies of our mortality, as Turner observes, but to the possibility of immortality. In all of these studies of Sukkot observance in the United States and Israel, individuals built structures of equality, architectures of interpretation, and spaces of potential that mediate between self and society, historic and present circumstances, and the actual and ideal living conditions. The crisis of the asylum seekers and housing protest movement in Israel vividly demonstrated the experiences of dislocation and economic privation among various populations, raising questions about practicing the values of faith and the relationship between ideal notions of home and the realities of inadequate housing. Both socio-political events centered on the search for home also provoked a reconsideration of the notion of social belonging for foreigners in Israel and for marginalized Israelis themselves. Although the narrative of impermanent shelter at the heart of Sukkot experience was challenged by the actual lack of shelter undermining the lives of many individuals, the transcendent permanence of the sukkah offered respite and hope through an annual opportunity to create an ideal vision of home. Thank you. Thank you all for sitting. <laughs> this, this, is, this is a picture of my great-grandparents, actually, in, um, in Germany in the early 30s. <laughs> my great-grandparents. Yep. <laughs> Naftali and Frida. <laughs> Thank you all on a late evening for sitting through all of that. So would you open here to questions? Sure. Sure. I'm happy to. Yes. Yes. Um, I just have to take this. Can I just carry this? Yes, hi. What made you decide to study? Why did I study this? What, what made you decide yeah. to investigate this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's always a good question for anyone in any folklore project. Um, well, I began. I began with a real interest in ritual traditions, and uh, particularly in the home. I began with a, with a project that looked at Jewish uh, material culture in the home space and domestic uh, religious practice. So it could be called sometimes vernacular religion also, but looking at how people informally expressed their beliefs and faith in home spaces. And it wasn't only in the Jewish context, I was interested in, in other cultural context as well. But when I, I started looking more deeply in the context of um, Jewish communities, I realized that my interest in material culture and in home rituals, the question of home, and the demarcation between sacred space and regular ordinary space was really well expressed in the holiday of Sukkot. The case of Sukkot is a perfect example in which to look at, at individuals actually building and decorating and interpreting um, an architectural structure and then the space within that is symbolic of the home as ritual. So it, it, was a, it became the case study through which I was able to ask the questions I wanted about uh, material culture, the value of these material objects and spaces, and then how one conceptualizes and creates a home space uh, in, in in the context of religious practice and ritual practice. So it was, it really, it really served me well. I didn't grow up celebrating Sukkot, actually, um, very much, maybe once or twice um, on the roof of our building. But, um, but as far as a way to bring together the fields of vernacular architecture and ritual practice and Jewish um, belief and custom, it really, it was a perfect moment. Thank you. Yes. Digging a little deeper into materiality, did you pick up any 
think the rabbinic um, discomfort with the excessive materiality of some of these because yeah. on the one hand there's an obligation to beautify a ritual right. or, or a holiday on the other it sort of takes away right. completely with the ephemerality and then putting in your phone and your lights and your TV <laughs> and your, right. you know, your, your Zen chair and all the rest. So right. It uh, seems like a great paradox. Yeah. That's so a did you, did you yes. get any hints of rabbinic caution? So number one, and just mm -hmm. slightly, we're used to now, I guess, here in California and, and uh, Jewish culture now, that we have Ishtazim, we have right. ancestor yes. decorators. There, I didn't see it except yeah. maybe in one, which was mm -hmm. too small for me to visualize. Yes. And yeah. they had their cultural carpets and, and decorative fabric. Yeah. Yes, that's a, another great point. I, both good, great questions. Um, thank you. I, so for the first one, what I didn't show you here, and, and largely from my Brooklyn period of field work, I, I worked in um, Crown Heights, which is the Lubavitch Chabad community. And so that tradition, um, the tradition that is specific to, the, to Chabad Jews is not to decorate at all. There are no decorations. And so you see wooden Sukkot largely just to, four wooden walls and um, the roofing and nothing inside. And I spoke with rabbis and, and individuals in the neighborhood and many conversations about exactly that. What is the reason for no decorations? And of course, in their kind of philosophy, there are several explanations. But one is um, you do not want to distract from the skach, which is this like holy, which is the holy material you are supposed to look up at, you know, raise your eyes up to that to, to connect with the transcendent spiritual being and force. So uh, there is a real belief that the, any material decorations will distract you from that direct connection. And that's one of the reasons to, to explicitly, that they explicitly acknowledge no decoration. In other cases where there, you know, like for example with the Moroccan case where there was such lavish decoration, um, you know, people, I did have a little bit more interpretation about that very issue from his daughter who wanted to think about why her father does this you know he why he collects so much and it's so important to him to decorate to the hilt each year um, and you know each case has an individual history of the builder that is a, an important context for their relationship to the material so for him really growing up with nothing made him not value this as, um, you know, for its materiality, but for the kind of hope that, it, for the associations that were attached to it that related to the holiday narratives. So it kind of came back to the themes of uh, spirituality and hope and salvation and um, survival. And he was able to do that by creating a space that allowed him to dream of that. So the, the materiality was always kind of an instrument on its way to something greater when I allowed people to interpret it for me. Otherwise, you do get a visual array of excess often. Uh, and as far as the Ushpizin, yes, there are many, many, many images of Ushpizin and traditions of welcoming them in each night. Um, I didn't have a lot of close-up images here. Um, one thing that is also common in the neighborhood that I, I think is uncommon perhaps outside of Mizrahi communities, although I'd, I'm interested in learning more about this, is Elijah's chair. Uh, many, uh, several families put a chair aside in a corner of the sukkah, maybe covered with nice cloth, and they put um, you know, holy texts on it for Elijah. Some families hang the chair from the top of their sukkah, and that was something that I've heard is also, a, a, I think it was a Moroccan family that did that. Um, that's that's particular to to those communities. So there there were kind of um, there was a range of welcoming the spiritual guests each night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <coughs>
Yeah, really great questions. Um, so as far as it being a, the liminal space that brings different, potentially different communities or individuals together, um, I think there, was, there were many examples, but one of the, the really profound ones was um, during the Occupy movement or in Israel um, in 2011, because that sukkah in the park that you saw became this community sukkah uh, so these were two individuals who were kind of like leading the, the protesters movement in South Tel Aviv in the, from Shkunat HaTikva. And they had built this uh, right after coming back from a big protest demonstration at the 11th hour before the holiday began. And the whole holiday they had um, gatherings in there. And then the very last night they had planned to invite um, a politician, uh, well, first an individual, Ruben um, Abergel, who is the formerly Israeli Black Panther leader. And he had come back on the scene and was um, really involved in the, in the protests, in the Mizrahi community's protests. And, um, and Rabbi Amsalam, who's also had a political party at that point, they had invited him from the Knesset as two honorary guests on the last evening to celebrate the holiday. And that was their, that was their invitation. But they spread the word to everybody who was involved in the park protests to come and listen. And the, the uh, the gathering, um, you know, I write about it more in the book, but the, uh, the rabbi political figure really spoke to the value of, um, he spoke about the ritual bundle, the four species, and talked about the arava, one of the plants, which is, you know, thought to have the least, fewest qualities, no qualities of fragrance or sight, and, and, but yet the bundle is nothing without it. It's this togetherness. And so he spoke in kind of poetic, metaphors about disadvantage through you know an interpretation of of the ritual practice and ritual materials and it was a it was a very veiled um kind of speech that was all about the holiday and yet he knew why he was there at that moment uh and ruben abergel spoke as well explicitly about kind of the connection between the holiday and and the inequality socioeconomic issues in israeli society afterwards uh Everybody, the residents and the protesters who attended, you know, kind of made it. They, right before he left, they really said, started to talk about the issues, the protest issues. And, and he said, this is a holiday. We don't want to talk about that. We want to keep the mood right. So we're only going to talk about the holiday. And so there continued an interesting dialogue as a way to talk about um, contentious issues, um, even among people in the sukkah who didn't all believe the same thing, but through the narrative of the of the of Sukkot. Um, so that was, that was, is that what you were asking about a little bit? You were, or were you asking about the opposite, about like the fragmentation that's possible also? Oh, right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, so the other the event that framed it all, of course, with the asylum seekers, I mean, that was where it was the really complicated, interesting issue. I mean, these were uh, Eritrean and Sudanese asylum seekers walking through this neighborhood that is fairly small at its core. Everybody knows everybody. And you're sitting outside in your sukkah, you see people walk by. Um, and often we'd be talking in the sukkah about hospitality and about what they believe. And, you know, not everyone needs to actively invite people in, but 
there was an acknowledgement that maybe they, you know, we might look over and then discuss, would you invite everybody in passing by, you know, to try and understand where the boundaries are on this holiday between, um, you know, host and guest. And, and there were families that said absolutely anybody who wants to come in can come in, including those asylum seekers. And then there were others that said, I just don't feel safe. I don't feel right. And yet they you know, declared a real belief in opening their doors to everyone as a value. And so then they had to really grapple with, what does that mean? And people would quote the Talmud. One man said, you know, it says, you know, I care about these people. They've been through so much. But you're supposed to take care of your own city's poor before the poor of another city. And that's, that's where I'm at. And then they would reflect it back on the government. They'd really say, I'm, I'm in this position, this awful position, because of the government. So there was a complicated reconciliation or attempt at that. Um, so it wasn't, it was, there was no uniform kind of approach to it. But I forgot your second question. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I would just say that, you know, in Bloomington, as I kind of noted, it's a much, it's a smaller community. It's a college town. Um, people lived in kind of suburban enclaves often. And these Sukkot were built, in, there was a lot of privacy. They were built in the backs of their houses. You didn't know people were celebrating unless there was a word of mouth. That's how I got around. Everybody said, oh, you got to go to this person, you got to go to this person. Um, otherwise, there was no other way to figure it out. And uh, you know, by contrast, in densely Jewish neighborhoods like Williamsburg or Crown Heights in Brooklyn, the whole landscape changes. You know, they're on fire escapes, on roofs, on the street. There's always, there's always articles about how these huge Sukkot in New York are blocking the streets, and the law enforcement has to get involved, and you know, trucks can't get by. And so there's kind of that quality that brings in the other everyday life of the city in, in more densely populated places. And then um, I chose that neighborhood in South Tel Aviv because it really is, uh, you know, there are lots of spaces, courtyard spaces, two-story structures. It's a neighborhood that people told me was more traditional. Um, and I didn't know what that meant, but I went and, and you know, I. I learned what that meant, but partly I chose the neighborhood really because of the physicality. I realized that this was a neighborhood where you could kind of, you could build your own sukkah, you could practice certain traditions uh, in public and transform kind of the shared neighborhood space through that. And I was interested in how, they, how people negotiated that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's a, that's a really good question. Um, I would say there were definitely some really challenging moments with regard to the asylum seeker situation. Um, the neighborhood, um, that neighborhood in particular, is de was depicted in the media very frequently and aggressively as a racist kind of community because they were, there was such a backlash against the influx of asylum seekers. And many things that people said sounded, you know, you know, excerpted on the news really sounded not great about wanting to get rid of these populations and, you know, it's not fair and this and that. And, and there, there wasn't, you know, residents weren't necessarily equipped with the language or the um, nuanced argument to articulate their frustration with the government versus their frustration with people every day around them that, you know, groups of new people in their neighborhood that they didn't know anything about. And so, so you know, I, as, as a kind of outsider, um, you know, I mean, I could also say a whole lot about what it was like to be like Ashkenazi in that neighborhood because people said that, you know, they loved kind of teasing me about my whiteness and my Ashkenazi heritage. And it was a way to really become close and learn about each other. But it was the insider-outsider relationships that I had to people were, were complex to begin with. 
and the neighborhood was very defensive to begin with of outsiders. Um, so when I was there trying to understand their relationship to these, this new population of asylum seekers, I felt empathy for both sides. I mean, there was, it was really a difficult circumstance for everyone. And there were protests, as you saw, in, in central Tel Aviv. And I would say, are you going to those protests? Are you going to attend them? And you know, I remember the first time I said something like that, and, and, and I said, shouldn't you band together you know, with these asylum seekers? If you're trying to make a point to the government, can't you all do something together and make, you know, do a march together? And people really rejected that. They really, they really were upset that I might have some loyalty or allegiance to this other population because they felt so put upon and they felt so neglected and they just didn't have room for me to be thinking outside of supporting them. And so there was a moment. Actually, Preston, where they're using actually sort of quasi academic language, sort of it's a culture. And yeah. Place. So, how is it in some sense that you saw, to what extent did you find that audits? Mm -hmm. To what extent did you find that audits to potentially sometimes clash? Mm -hmm. what, what did you see in terms of the ways in which people thought about those fundamental issues about family and, mm -hmm. this, and also race? Because I mean, working in Jewish Latin communities, mm -hmm. I mean, race is not a small issue there. Mm -hmm. Some of the racial perceptions and that enter into discourses of race in relationship to these other people who are also not white. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, I would say I, you know, I had so many conversations and s many. You know, many sounded somewhat similar to others, sometimes in their interpretations and individuals' interpretations of their structures or their, of the story. Um, but there's always some people that really stand out, and like Sivan, the daughter of Shaul, and Shaul, they were two who just were so, they, they were, you know, vernacular kind of philosophers. They, they really were able to look at what they were doing and think about what it meant to them on, outside of themselves which not everybody is able to do because they're sometimes really wrapped up in the practice. But um, as far as you know, my interpretations conflicting or, or me disagreeing or, or challenging anyone else's, I think when I was doing the research, I wasn't at that stage. I was really interested in asking questions about their interpretations, whatever they were. Um, when I came back and I tried to begin to go through all of that, then I was able to really think about my own place in relation to it. But in the, in the field, while I was uh, gathering, I really tried, I, I never tried to shut anyone down, or I never was in the position where I felt that I needed to stand against um, any particular analysis, personal <laughs> analysis. Um, I, I think the most challenging was, was really in those discussions of hospitality and how do you know when to let someone in or keep someone out in the community? Um, the more I learned, the more context I gathered for the histories of these individuals and the community in this neighborhood, <coughs> the more I understood where people were coming from and how you know, inherited histories of discrimination uh, and immigration really formed a current worldview and how how individuals were able to separate themselves from what they brought with them and what they're experiencing today or not. And so that's what I was kind of interested in parsing. You know, where are they, where is this really coming from? Um, yes. <laughs> so at the really beautifully stated end of the paper where you were talk, contrasting ephemerality and, and materiality and continuity, I wondered, I thought you were going to go one step further <laughs> from that last photo, and I just wondered what, which is the dismantling of the sukkah. Uh -huh. And I wondered whether that was, what, what you found in that, whether there was anything particularly interesting in that, in the storage of the pieces. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, that particularly came to mind in, when you were talking about places where people are collecting things off the street. Right. Which would, do they then save them for the next year or not? So yeah. I just wish you could talk about because it, it, to have something that's so sacred and then it's gone. Yeah. So what, 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 what happens with that liminal space of the liminal space? Yeah, I was interested in talking to people about when they started thinking about it also. When, mm -hmm. you know, the holiday begins one day and it ends one day, but mm -hmm. when do they begin 
where does Sukkot lie in their minds otherwise, begin at, before it and after it? When does it end? Um, so with respect to the dismantling, um, I mean, one interesting moment in the parks during the protest movement was during that very that conversation with the rabbi, um, Rabbi Amsalam, one woman, a homeless woman from the neighborhood said, hey, listen, she just said finally, like explicitly, she said, why can't we just leave these Sukkot standing? Like, what is the difference? We still eat matzah all year. You know, why can't we leave the structure all year? And he said, okay, well, look, I don't, I don't want to talk about it much, but if you just do something to the skak, if you remove it, a piece of it, it won't be kosher for the holiday the way it was, and you can leave it standing. And so that's what they did. And this one, they reinforced immediately the next day with, with um, rainproof tarps and fluorescent lights. And, you know, so in the park, those Sukkot became shelters for till through December. Um, and that became a really meaningful next step for, you know, in, in the story of this Occupy moment and Sukkot. But, but outside, but of, outside that, of that, because that was yeah. exceptional. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, people, yes, many people liked to identify where they store certain pieces. You know, it might be the bamboo roof if, they, if it was a reusable one or, or prefabricated metal poles or tarps. There were specific spots they usually had. Um, they were also, you know, very casual about the other kind of reused and recycled materials, like half doors and wind and you know wooden planks. People would find them each year and use them, and then not care to save those. So there was a kind of circulation of material all the time in the neighborhood. Um, decorations were. You know, the tapestries, the people who had those meaningful ones, of course, that was like kind of the height of salvation. But, but otherwise, the practice, especially with families of creating the space anew and kind of how it developed over the years of their children's youth or their own lives, that was part of their story. And I think the change was really, for them, more interesting than talking about how, it, how, it remained the, how all the materials remain the same. Yeah. No, she's the only one I encountered who did that. I asked her wh where that came from in her family. She didn't know. She just said it was my, it came in my family. She, um, Dina, she was of Yemenite descent. Yes. Yeah, I didn't see that anywhere else. Yeah. Is, the, is timing okay? I don't know what. About five more minutes. Okay. We kept you going a Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm happy. These are great questions. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's a really great question. Um, you know, gentrification into southern Tel Aviv, into like this neighborhood, Hatikva, has also started since this research. It really, it really wasn't happening so much when I was there, but in the past few years, I went. I've been back, and it it has started a little bit. And um, and I, di I haven't had a chance to talk to people at length about it, and I didn't back then either because there were so many other issues. <laughs> but um, but my my sense is that there's not total rejection of it the way there there might have been rejection of other those other issues that were really kind of vital in in that moment. Um, I I think a lot of the people that I spoke to have, you know, are interested in renting their parents' houses out also who lived in that neighborhood and may no longer be able to live there. Um, so they were actually happy to have somebody rent them out. There are a couple, two families that did that since I've been there and they seemed pleased to have 
managed to rent out their houses there to younger people. But that's not representative of everyone at all. But it, no, that's a good question. I know in, in Yaffa it's a huge issue that is very contentious. So yeah, I didn't experience it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I do my work in Bali in performance and space and play mm -hmm. and music in particular, but other kinds of performance. And so much of it, uh, there are so many analogous things. So there's one ritual that's called machadu, that's just a ritual purification of mm. the village. Every village does it at a certain time where they uh, will take like a main intersection of a village and stop all traffic and just sort of camp out there for several days mm -hmm. and have all sorts of Shadow plays and, and different kinds of exorcistic rituals. It's a purification rite, wow. and it's like it's also kind of creating this um, space of mm -hmm. ephemerality. And um, traffic has to stop, has to, has to be diverted, yeah. and the entire community uh, participates in it. And this the Kachala seems like it's also doing this kind of ritual work, and it's temporary. Yet mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. And I like the way you connected that mm -hmm. with permanence. But I was wondering, so kind of in line with Jen's question about taking it apart, but going further with that, after the, doing the ritual work of creating the space and having that mm -hmm. experience in there, will that then clear the path for something else? Is there a sense of kind of renewal? Or if, if someone mm -hmm. doesn't do it, there will be kind mm -hmm. of this. Well, I think, um, yes. So yeah, I mean, I very basically wanted to know why people did this every year. You know, why do you, why do you build this? Because you know, the range of religiosity was, was vast. So of course, there's Orthodox populations. But then, you know, Sivan, that, you know, so she's a graphic designer in cent you know, center, central Tel Aviv and very radical and, and obviously says she does it for a father and love. And so you know, there was, there all that, that huge range. Um, and I think um, the man, I don't, he, he's the one who used the parachot from his mother and father, the Kurdish parents, to hang in the sukkah. He's, he really went on at length about, in a very beautiful way, and, and there's more of this represented in the book, but about um, how it is a structure of equality and what it means to have a moment each year to sit there and think about you know, what it means for you to be a host or for you to be the guest and how he has difficulty being a guest. And he went into a, a, long, um, a long narrative about what, why that is in the context of his life and his history and how he really meditates on it every year. And this is his moment when he comes and sits and every single year tries to understand how we can be a better society together and contextualize this with a, with a difficult life history of his parents, lots of discrimination and um, difficulty and hardship. And he, he values this week in that way very much as a democratic moment of potential. You know, he, that's how he kept describing it. This is the moment we have to change things. After the holiday's over, we go back to our lives. So I think he kind of captured that. For him, it was really an opportunity. And then it's gone because you go back to your busy lives. And, and to varying degrees, I kind of heard. Continuing after it's done, you've done this. Right. Of clearing the path for these new relationships. And yeah, well, I mean, his, he communicated as a, you know, you, through discussion, through gathering together, through our convers com conversation he and I had, you are taking a step that will have an effect after. You're helping to create, like, divert the path in a new direction that's progress. But, um, you know, how you follow up, I, I, the only way that it, I, I saw it manifest is that I did visit him throughout the year, for example, in this particular case. And I visited him once at work. And, um, and he said, you know, I got there in the middle of a busy work day, and I was just going to chat with him that day for, for half an hour or something in his office. And he said, have you eaten lunch? And I was like, oh, you know, I'm fine. Don't worry. And he said, no, 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 no. You first you eat together, then you talk. And so we went to the kitchen, and we had lunch in the office kitchen. And he talked about how this is, this is what Sukkot's about. I mean, it was months after Sukkot. He said, 
that's why we do it. We eat together, we talk. This is all about creating relationships across boundaries. So he did manage to keep that in his mind and his practice. But um, I, wasn't, I, I don't know that others expressed it to me as much in that way. But I'd have to think. That's a good question, yeah. Thank you for all the. Here, but, uh, thank her for her talk. Thank you. Thank you all for staying. <laughs> and also after the talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>